Chip from Columbus Calling. Rustin Kelly seems like the kind of guy you want to be friends with. His laid-back, chill demeanor reminds me of Matthew McConaughey. He's married to Grammy Award winner Casey Musgraves. And, most importantly, he's not afraid to admit that he loves metal. Rustin's music is most easily described as country, although the singer has invented a new term for what he does. In a Twitter post in late January, Rustin posted a photo of a t-shirt with a caption that read, quote, I literally made shirts that say dirt emo, because that is officially my genre, end quote. The Nashville singer counts Chris Caraba of Dashboard Confessional as a fan, so hey, who am I to argue with that description? Not sure if Rustin and I are going to trade cell numbers when he's in Columbus and become texting pen pals, but during our recent conversation, I felt like I was talking to somebody that I've known my entire life. Here it is. Check it out. So, um, seems to me like 2018 was probably a pretty good year for you between the album, touring, making a bunch of videos, landing on a bunch of year-end best of lists. So, which would you say is more accurate, or maybe they both are? Uh, did it feel like kind of all the hard work finally paid off, or was it more like, pinch me, I must be dreaming? <laughs> uh, I would say, I would say that it was a sense of we're just we're seeing fruits of like labor and and it being like kind of this yeah sure like i was super excited about all the stuff but the fact that it was so late in the year when you know we finally felt like the ball got rolling it did feel since like this is my first album at least my first like being on a sick record label and having a great team behind me and like a genuine and sober push like since we, you know, started campaigning for this record in May. So uh, it came out September and it did feel like, okay, cool. Like we put in a lot of fucking hard work into this and seeing it pay off as far as press goes and tour goes, you know, for a first go around at this, it's, it felt really good. Yeah. And, and this is almost like in the, in the album release cycle, almost still in the early days, correct? Since it just came out. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. We're um, we're only a few months into really like the thick of release, so we we got we took care of a lot of promo for it and radio station visits on the first part of the tour, but that'll kind of continue um, through, you know, through the rest of this album cycle at least for the first half of the year. Yeah. And actually, that, that I had a question about that. So you're going to be in Columbus in February with the Brothers Osborne, and I know that you're doing your own headlining dates. Um, have you already started looking forward to spring and summer touring plans? Or are those kind of already in the works, or is that something that, that is going to um, happen as it comes? Uh, it's already in the works. We uh, we've got a we've got a lot of stuff in the works, pretty much till around this time next year. Oh, that's awesome. Oh. So, yeah, it's a lot of work to be done. I mean, I, hopefully this record, you know, this record cycle, like, lasts a while. Uh, I'll be touring on it for the rest of this year, at least. Wow. Is that a little daunting to think about, or is that kind of awesome to think about? It's awesome to think about, because the touring that, I mean, I've done a lot of touring in my life, but I just didn't have, like, I didn't have a sense of direction at all, and at the time i was you know not not doing so well personally so a lot of times i don't really like remember it and it was to no effect and it was like playing shit and i just didn't like i didn't know what i was doing and having a singular purpose and knowing what i'm doing with it and seeing it pay off and to build this thing slowly but surely i think is really exciting and seeing it happen you know um, week by week is, is really awesome. Yeah. So I first became aware of Dying Star, I think in probably early December. And, um, and, I, and I'm completely serious when I say that I've listened to it. It's like, it's a great album to listen to start to finish for me. Um, and I've listened to it, great. like I said, I'm not kidding, at least once a day, every day since I discovered it. Um, and so I've, I've used it uh, in many ways as different soundtracks to different things. Um, I have family in Cleveland, which is about two hours away, and, and as I was driving home this past weekend, um, it was like later in the afternoon, kind of sunset, and it sort of provided this great soundtrack. Um, oh, we, damn. That's we were, a great way to listen to it. Yeah. We were in Florida over the holidays, and I did some walking on the beach and listened to it, and I use it when I'm going to sleep at night, 
So I'm wondering if you could influence how somebody experiences Dying Star for the first time, what kind of situation do you feel is like the perfect listening situation for the album? I think the first one that you said. The drive. Because, yeah, the drive, more the sunset. I mean, I, I don't know why, but I just kept seeing those colors, of the, especially like in those rare moments where you're driving home and like, yeah, the sun setting is fucking awesome any, any time, but just when it's like really pink or like really like, it really looks like it's a watercolor kind of sky. I just kept seeing that and it was a big motif for this record anyways, as far as like a letting something kind of in a, in a beautiful sense die so something else can be reborn. You know, tomorrow was a giant theme you know, musically, personally, and thematically. Yeah. So I would say the first, the first one. And also, I when I was a baby, my dad, when he wanted to sneak cigarettes, like he would <laughs> drive around the neighborhood and he would put on Jackson Brown. And I think at an early age, like I just kind of correlated movement and driving and seeing things pass with music. Yeah. So. Uh... Tell me your perfect albums to listen to in those situations of the sunset road trip, the long walk on the beach, and falling asleep. Okay, great. I love that. Okay. Um, for a long drive, I would say Jackson Brown, For Every Man. That record is quintessential highway music. Yep. I would say for... Walking on the beach. Walking on the beach, I would have to go with. Well, I mean, I love Slipknot, and I can listen to that in any setting. But I think that usually I'm pretty reflective if I'm walking on the beach. Uh, beach Boys. Yep. That sounds like a good time. Can't go wrong with that. Or. Uh, yeah, either that or like William Bazinski. I don't know if you ever heard of that composer. Mm-mm. Immigration tapes. And it's um, he basically recorded like he's kind of this new age composer, but he recorded like these analog tape tracks that were he recorded them as they were disintegrating, hmm. and the sound that resulted from that is like it's really haunting, but like really beautiful, and you can kind of get in a meditative state with it. And let's see, what was it there in falling asleep? Yeah. I mean, it's a sound machine. I can't listen to music <laughs> when I fall asleep. If I do, it's like, um, I would say Ben Howard. Okay. All good choices. So, um, like I mentioned, I'm a huge fan, and I've been trying to tell all of my friends about the music. And um, bear with me here for a second, but the way that I describe it is I tell people that when I was in high school, and I'm, I'm – uh, you know, kind of late forties here. Um, so I, I grew up in, in teenage years in kind of the late eighties and I would read heavy metal magazines and I could, I could pick up hit parader magazine and read articles about Iron Maiden, Billy Idol, Bon Jovi, and Slayer. None of which, sound, yes. none of which sound alike. Right. So what I tell people is while I wouldn't call you a country artist, like they might be used to like a Brad Paisley or Kenny Chesney, if I walked into a record store, I'd expect somebody to say that I could find your album in the country section. Do you think that's sort of a fair assessment on how to describe what you do? I think it's, yeah, I mean, genres are, I mean, it's almost silly at this point. What we consider what, you know? Oh, yeah. And I think people need to categorize things and putting something into a context definitely helps someone understand something better and it can also you know be on the shelf at walmart so if that's like country to someone then i mean fine i don't necessarily like play the country game right just never been interested in um in as far as like my artwork being in that industry like i'll play along you know Mm -hmm. and cmt and like uh the cma people and stuff have been really gracious like and been really like the music and have been spreading the word quite a bit on their social media platforms but like i kind of let those things come to me or like rolling stone country yeah if they write about i appreciate it 
uh, I wouldn't necessarily even describe myself as country. You know? Yeah. It's fucking folk music. Right. <laughs> it's people music. Uh, it's my life story. It's always going to be that way. And, I mean, shit, my next record might sound the same. It might sound different, but I do love a steel guitar. <laughs> That's probably what does it. <laughs> right, right. Um, so over the last couple of years, I've interviewed, I feel like, a, a number of artists that reside in Nashville. Um and most of them don't belong or don't fit under the country genre. And so I'm wondering, and I know that you're a transplant to Nashville, not born there, but in my mind, Nashville has always been the country music capital. And it seems to me, again, this is just my interpretation, is that it's becoming more of just more of a music city, more generic, and there's a lot going on. It, it, again, is that a fair assessment? Or do you think that that kind of non-country music has always kind of been around Nashville, but maybe it's maybe it's getting more prominence now because of some of the bands um i'm a fan of like a band like bully who really is dude i fucking love band, bully right? yeah i love bully but but like uh lily hyatt who's kind of in the same genre of you you know there's, there's this whole wide variety of stuff that's not easily categorized as country yeah i would say man i would say both to answer your question i would say that it has always been here. It's always been an attractive city, I think, because it, you know, became country music capital of the world and actually has always been that way since the, since it developed an industry. I mean, it developed an industry around folk country and bluegrass, but I think that that is such, like, people music that, you know, it's a magnet to any musician. And I think that's one thing I love about Nashville is, that is the tradition to me of country music that there's a sense of community and family and like reverence for the song yeah and that's something you don't really find in many genres and i think it harbors musicians in general songwriters in general people that are passionate to work in the music business in general that is such a difference between this town and los angeles or new york i mean there's the hustle everybody wants to get paid and wants to climb up the ladder but there is a really like a strong sense of family and community in this town. Um, and I think that's why like a lot of other types of music have started to kind of come through the cracks ironically, because what people think is country music isn't really happening anymore, but it's still being called country Yeah, kind of open the lanes for people to be like, well, if you call Kane Brown fucking country, like then I have a chance in this town, you know? Yeah. Did um did I read correctly that you ended up in Nashville because your sister lived there? Yeah, yeah, she did. And was it so? Was your plan all along to use Nashville as your launch pad, or was it like a great place to crash and see what it was all about because you knew somebody there? Yeah, it was more the latter. I didn't really have a plan. I knew that I was broke, uh, and I knew that you know I loved Bob Dylan and I loved Dave Von Rock and I loved the folk revival of the 60s and part of me wanted to recreate that for myself and just moved to New York and like if I had to like you know live in a hop house or like if I had to you know do what I had to do I would do it and I, I didn't really know what I was doing other than I was headed like home or something like I was just following what was a natural path to me but I didn't really put it into a career context until, you know, I would say the past year and a half. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I never really thought about, you know, I'm going to pursue the, pursue the dream. I was just going to kind of live my life. Yeah. So I, I, I like to, um, when, when I hear about a new artist, kind of do a little digging around. And um, I don't think this is something that you, you're necessarily hiding or running from. But I did, you know, find... Uh, stuff about the Elmwood band out there. Um, <laughs> so my question is, how can you tell me about the evolution of, uh, did you go by Rusty at the time? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can call me Rusty. That's how I introduced yeah. myself. It's uh, like what my family has always called me. I mean, Rustin is is a cooler, like, sounding stage for sure. name to stamp on an but album. Gonna, but, I mean... Yeah, I was gonna, uh, it sounds a little formal sometimes. Yeah, I was going to ask the evolution of Rusty Kelly, the lead singer of a jam band, to Rustin Kelly, singer songwriter. Like, what was that evolution? How did that? How did that? 
how did that change the way you wrote songs? Well, I would say that I had always like Mother Maybell from the Carter family was I would say the biggest influence on my style of playing guitar. But I also kind of come from like, yeah, I love metal. I also loved Dave Matthews band and specifically Dave Matthews style of writing on the guitar. Um, I liked the fact that like you could take it somewhere else other than just like three chords of the truth. Mm -hmm. And I liked where uh, like, you know, jam bands at the time were super popular. And I really kind of, I loved how things could just go from, you know, <laughs> this moment turning into a completely different moment within a song that you loved and you never knew could have those added and extra colors and moments to it. Right. So I would say that like I was writing the songs that I like right now. I've always kind of written that and just try to get better at doing that. And then I met this kid when I was working on a um, chicken farm in North Carolina he was a bass player and he was fucking wicked. Like I'd never heard bass playing like that before. Just, he played it like Jimmy Page would play the guitar. It was insane. And so we just started jamming and I started like making up riffs and he could play them and we started doing this thing. And then just, you know, songs kind of evolved from that. And it was kind of this side project of what I had been doing and lanes I wasn't in. And I was like, well, this is fun as hell. Like, let's see where this rabbit hole goes. Yeah. And that actually ended up putting me, you know, uh, somewhere, if it wasn't infinitesimally small, on the map in Nashville, because we got Paradigm's interest. This It's a pretty large booking agent who I'm still with today. And they put us out on the road, put us in a van, and we, we fucking hit it. Yeah. I, I noticed when I, because I, I, I came across the old Facebook page, and it seemed like you did do a lot of shows. Yeah, man, we toured, we toured a lot. I mean, and we, that's where I got my touring chops. It was rough, like, it was a quartet, and, you know, we would go to a roadway inn and share a king bed, you yeah. know, or, like, if, you know, we constantly were always together, slept in the van some nights, and did that for a couple years. Right. It, it was funny you, the way you described what appealed to you about jam band kind of music because um, I'm kind of putting two and two together here because you said you love metal too and you mentioned Slipknot and it even feels to me like within a Slipknot song you'd even hear that total change in direction in the middle of a song. Absolutely. Absolutely. They go from screaming. I mean, like Corey Taylor is great at that. I mean, he goes from that guttural angry howl to like this desperate beautiful melody that it's just really catchy yeah i think that's that, that was always really fascinating to me it's funny because I, I feel um somewhat akin to you here in that um i mean i i grew up and i still love metal especially like i said with my age um <laughs> the 80s hair metal big hair leather pants is my favorite stuff even to this day and still i'll listen to your album every single day you know what i mean it's like uh oh, I, love that. I sort of have this 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 wide range of music tastes um so are you into like the more heavy metal stuff yeah uh i was uh, yeah i got like heavy into like black metal for a minute like almost too heavy where i was like <laughs> dang am i getting some like bad juju from like liking this shit right <laughs> i mean you know like I started doing, doing my research. I love to know where, like, bands come from, you know, as you do. Yeah. And I was like, dang, these fucking guys are, like, legit crazy. Right. <laughs> like, like, one of, uh, what was it? Um, well, I love Mayhem. They're great. I saw them in Nashville. But, damn, man, like, one of the guys, like, blew his brains out, and, like, the band found him, and he left a note that said, sorry for the mess, cheers. Yeah. And before they called the cops, they – took a Polaroid picture and then took fragments of this dude's skull and wore it as a necklace and then passed it around as a rite of passage for metal bands through the black metal circuit. And I was like, all right, <laughs> a little much for me, yeah. for me even. Right. Well, I kind of, I, I love like, I would say I love like the heaviest I kind of go now is like crowbar. Oh yeah. 
like more on the Doom side of things. And interestingly enough, Crowbar has a pretty uh, strongly positive message to the lyrics. I mean, it's it's exactly what I write about. Like, yeah, you know, <laughs> suffering is a prerequisite to joy, basically. Yeah. Have you ever gone down that path? I know um, somebody that I kind of put you in the same ballpark is is Ryan Adams, and I know Ryan has done some recording of some like heavy stuff. Have you have you ever gone down that that route and and thought about or actually re- recorded any heavy music? Man, um, I I haven't like that anyone knows about. Like <laughs> I'll I'll jam that like with my friends. We're just fucking around. And I have a pretty mean growl, and I would love to, like, someday, instead of do it where it's, like, where Ryan was so obvious, but do it where it's, like, not obvious at all, you know? Like, I would just be, like, the drummer in the back, yeah. and, like, you know, I don't know, wear a fucking disguise, or, like, I wouldn't give a fuck. I mean, I also love, like, punk music. Like, it'd be cool to be in a band like Napalm Death would be sick, you know? Yeah. Have you uh, have you secretly thought of any any band names that you'd use? Hmm. Oh, Satan Eater would be <laughs> sick. Uh, Bloodfuck would be awesome. Just like just shock value. Just make everybody uncomfortable. Yeah. So thank you so much. Like I said, like I'm I'm such a huge fan, and I and I uh, I can't get enough of it. So it's awesome talking to you. And thank you. And uh, you lived up to everything I was hoping for, so that's good. <laughs> I don't know, man. Well, I appreciate you taking the time. Yeah. Great questions. That was, that was fun. 